First of all, realizing that if we were a little bit more proactive and if quite honestly, if people just had a knowledge base that was a little bit better, we could prevent a lot of those problems. As you know, Sean, you know, a lot of people, even diabetics don't make the association between high carb intake and their high blood sugar. Because in my mind, that's the patient you can do the most good for. And and I particularly like taking care of people that are just on the fringe there in the pre-diabetic range, because you can change the, you know, you you can change the course of their lives. You know, us men would rather bury our heads in the sand until we really have a problem. But the women, the women get it. Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. We have a special guest today, Dr. Paul Kolodzik, I think. Is am I saying that right? Perfect. That Good. was perfect, actually. It was a guess, but it was my best guess. So anyway, welcome. Where are you, where are you located? I think you're in Ohio or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. I'm in Ohio, between Dayton and Cincinnati. Okay. Well, why don't you just start sharing a little bit about Backshine? I, I kind of look to see what you're up to, but I'd, if you'll share that with everybody, and, and that would be great to start there. Sure. So my background is as an emergency physician. I've spent 30 years in the emergency department. I saw you have a military background. Thanks for your service. I'm actually still working a day a week in the emergency department at the VA here in Dayton. Okay. Um, and, and the emergency medicine work is really kind of what brought me to metabolic health. Um, cause you know, what gets the press in the emergency department is the overdoses and the gunshot wounds. But, you know, as you know, What emergency physicians see every day, day in, day out, our bread and butter is vascular disease. And that's usually associated with high blood sugar and often associated with obesity. So after being reactive to those problems for many years, I opened a metabolic health practice about seven years ago. Yeah. And good for you for doing that. Because I mean, obviously what ER physicians are doing is incredibly important and very, in, in many cases, life-saving, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you, you think about the ER and it's trauma and gunshots, and but it's people coming in with their diabetic complications. And of course, MIs and, you know, DKA, and it's just, it's, it's a constant onslaught of what I call it, what, well, acute exacerbation of chronic disease, which you see pretty much day in and day out. That's probably, I don't know, maybe 90% of the traffic. I mean, you know better than I would, but for sure, that's important. Um, so what inspired you to, to like seven years ago, say, hey, <laughs> I want to do that. I want to, I want to stop this. I want to prevent this. What, what inspired that? Yeah, it was a confluence of those issues. Uh, First of all, realizing that if we were a little bit more proactive and if quite honestly, if people just had a knowledge base that was a little bit better, we could prevent a lot of those problems. As you know, Sean, you know, a lot of people, even diabetics don't make the association between high carb intake and their high blood sugar. You know, so we got a challenge in front of us related to education, but it was a combination of seeing that disease day in and day out, me having a personal interest in a a low carb approach. And then, you know, the strength training bit kind of meshed in pretty well. uh, When I found out the strength training and increased muscle mass could help with insulin resistance. So, you know, the Midwest has a, a big population of metabolic disease. And so there was an opportunity here to go ahead and help people. Yeah, he said, you know, I lived in the Midwest for many years. I grew up uh, in Illinois, Indiana, so I'm, you know, not right, right kind of in that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, because you, you mentioned even diabetics don't realize that maybe carbohydrate restricting, but that's, I mean, that's basically courtesy of the American Diabetes Association. They basically, yeah. their recommendation is, you know, eat whatever, 60 grams of carbs a meal, 100 grams of carbs per meal, and chase it with insulin if you're a type 2, you know, insulin dependent diabetic. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 I think it's a message that, you know, is ultimately harming more people than it helps for sure. I mean, that, we see it and we see it every day and, and, it, and it's not getting better, unfortunately. So how did you, I mean, obviously with ER, it's shift work, you know, you, I mean, most you know, ER docs working what, you know, 12, 14 shifts a month, whatever it is. So you can kind of just scale that up and down, which is kind of one of the specialties where you have that capacity to do that um and you said you're doing one 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 a week right one shift a week basically so you can one shift a week still at the va in the in the emergency department um actually previous since you're an air force guy previously worked at wright patterson air force base as a contractor in the emergency department yeah they've got a pretty Um, big but yeah i was able to scale down the emergency department work a little bit 
Um, and, and, you know, quite honestly, I moved, I shifted from community hospitals where you kind of got your butt kicked every shift to, I, I enjoy the VA because I actually have time to sit down and talk with the vets and, you know, explore the root cause of their issues. But I was able to scale things back and open my metabolic health practice initially just a day or two a week. And now we're getting busier and busier. Yeah, it's kind of fun. The VA does have a laid back pace. I mean, we saw a lot of people go there to kind of retire on you know, I, well, they, they, they sort of, they're in no hurry at the VA. I can tell you as a surgeon, when I used to work, they used to drive me crazy. Cause I was like, I'd have to, you know, yeah. I'd do a surgery. I have to wait three hours for the next one. Mm -hmm. So, cause no one was moving very fast, but that's a, you know, a whole different, different thing. But, um, so when you, uh, did you have a personal sort of, uh, health issue that drove you this way? Cause I did. I mean, the only, the only reason I'm here today preaching about, you know, fixing diet is because when I was 40, whatever, 42, 43, I was getting fat and not feeling good. And I said, F that I'm not going to do this anymore. And so did you have some sort of personal skin in the game type of thing with this? You know, I, I was a little bit overweight, not a lot. I mean, I was 20 or 25 pounds overweight and it, you know, I kind of educated myself uh, about insulin resistance and went and got an insulin level checked and, you know, it was not where I wanted it to be. Um, and really things just kind of progressed from there, you know, and, and I'm going to mention, I, I think you got a daughter that's a college athlete. Is that right? She's high school. Um, She's a high school. Shot oh, high school. High school? Still high okay. school. Yeah. That's great. So um, my uh, kids were wrestlers, both through high school and college. And, you know, you get pretty attuned to diet in your family. Um, when he, when he got wrestlers in the family. And, and so, you know, we, we researched that, you know, what was the best way for them to cut weight, but retain muscle. And so it was really kind of a confluence of this personal experience in the emergency department, needing to lo lose a little bit of weight, learning about insulin resistance. And then quite honestly, the diet that my kids were pretty diligently following. Yeah, no doubt wrestlers have to have to do some pretty extraordinary things. It's a pretty tough sport. You know, it's interesting, you know, because I've now talked to many, many physicians, including other orthopedic surgeons that like, they're like, I'm sick of the, I'm sick of the mainstream practice. I want to do this. I, I went and visited a guy down in Louisiana and he was like, happy when his surgery's canceled so he could go to his metabolic health clinic. You know, he was just like, yeah. I prefer doing yeah. this than the actual surgery, which is kind of crazy. How much, I mean, is this more rewarding to you as a physician doing this stuff versus, you know, the day-to-day -day ER stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's longitudinal care, which in the emergency department, we don't do, it's episodic care. So it, it's been very, very satisfying. Yeah, you know, but to address what, what you just alluded to, I got a lot of friends that are primary care docs and, you know, I may be dating myself a little bit, but but they're frustrated. When I got out of residency, there were still docs that were, you know, joining their own group practices, you know, hanging out a shingle even on their own. This is in the late 80s. You, you know, basically they were they were you know, small business people. And I've worked in some rural areas as well, where the docs were kind of the pillar of the community. They took care of people from the, when they were born to when they got sick and died. Um, and, you know, that model has changed now. Uh, unfortunately, most docs are working, you know, for large healthcare systems or, you know, sometimes um, you, you know, for-profit companies, and I'm not saying that's bad, you know, that's, you know, capitalism is a good thing, but they're frustrated by their inability to spend time with their patients doing the, some of the things that I get to do with my patients uh, because I have more time. You know, they've been relegated at times to just disease management. You know, how are we going to adjust the medicines today? So, you know, I've got a great relationship with a group of primary care docs that are referring patients for me. I, as an emergency physician, you know, I, I really don't have the background to manage complex medical problems, but but I certainly can support people and their diet and workout regimens um, to get them where they want to be to reduce their insulin resistance. Yeah, the 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 employed physician model has definitely got some limitations, and I I, I see that as you know I was an employed physician, and, and there were some things that you know. If you would, if you disagree with management or, or behaviors, it's kind of like too bad. Suck it up and just do it anyway, you know. And it's uh, it it really. I mean, I you know I think you know, and they. I think a lot of the physicians will be play re replace with 
you know, physician extenders, you know, you see that happening all the time just to save money. You know, so you're, instead of seeing a doc, you're going to see a PA or a nurse practice. And there's some great nurse practice and PAs, but at the same yeah. time, you don't quite have the training level. And I think eventually some of that's going to be automated. I mean, I think some aspect of healthcare is going to yeah. go into yeah. freaking, ro- you know, dang, yeah. you know, robots are going to be, you know, it's going to yeah. be some sort of online survey. Here's your pill. You know, I think that's eventually going to happen. But, um, so tell me how, I mean, w- was there some degree of trepidation when you first like hung out your shimble, shingle? Because that's got to be a little bit, you know, you don't know how this is going to go. And I mean, how did the early days go and how are you doing now with that? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Th- things were very positive right from the beginning. I mean, word of mouth um, here has been very positive and things grow. And, you know, you, you take care of of, you, you know, a few patients and word gets out, you, you know, and and it was very positive, actually, from the beginning. You know, I'm still growing. I'm still looking for a few more patients. Um, but, you, you know, it's busy and, and it's a good um, mesh. You know, it, it goes well along with my uh, my emergency department work. But now I'm at three days a week, um, you know, seeing patients all day in the metabolic clinic and you know, a day, week in the emergency department. So I'm just about as busy as I want to be, you know, and the satisfaction you get from that, you know, unfortunately in the emergency department, we don't get follow-up. You know, you admit that chest pain, you don't always know what happens. With these patients, I get to see the outcome and, you know, the vast majority of the time, it's very good. You get the follow up in the frequent flyers, as you know, the people that are in the ER every week, you know, (laughs) he's back again, they're back again, right? Yeah, but, uh, So, um, so it sounds like you're, 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 it's a physical location where you're seeing people in person. It's not online. It's it's basically physical, physically located in Dayton and people are coming through your door. Yeah, it's, it's both. Um, Yeah, you know, more people are gravitating toward telemedicine. And of course, you know, with this type of practice, um, it, it fits well. Um, so I'm, um, you know, I go to the office still to do a number of my telemedicine appointments, but actually the majority of the work now is telemedicine and I'm licensed in several states. And, and so, um, you know, that it's, it's, uh, I think an ability provides an ability to access people you wouldn't otherwise access. And I think, you know, that with your practice as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think there's, again, we talk about technology in a way of the future. And I think a lot of it, digital makes sense. I mean, it just, for, for not everything, obviously there's a lot of things you can't do over, over, over a, you know, a phone call or a zoom call, but, uh, there's a lot of stuff you can. What, uh, so what are, who are you seeing? I mean, are you, a, lot, a lot of obese people, a lot of diabetics. I mean, what's walking through your door and how are you managing that? Yeah, my, my focus is metabolic syndrome patients. Those are the patients that I want. You, you know, I've used CGMs extensively. Hopefully, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but but I, what I seek out is the metabolic syndrome patient, because in my mind, that's the patient you can do the most good for. Um, and, and I particularly like taking care of people that are just on the fringe there in the pre-diabetic range, because you can change the, you know, you, you can change the course of their lives. Um, you know, diabetics, of course, you know, you know, you can, we, we can get into semantics. You can reverse diabetes or put diabetes in remission, whatever, you, you know, term you want to use. But the pre-diabetics, you can actually pull back from the edge. So it's that overweight pre-diabetic patient that I really enjoy taking care of. And it quite honestly is the majority of my practice because we can reverse their pre-diabetes and they're heading this direction in terms of their health for the rest of their life. And we're able to redirect them. I've, I've had some, some young patients, you know, 20, 21, you know, families pre-diabetic, if families diabetic, they're pre-diabetic, they're overweight, you know, help them lose 60 pounds in their early 21s, put a CGM on them for a week and have them see those spikes, you know, and as they put it, they can't unsee that, that their lives get changed, the direction of their health for the rest of their life gets changed. I mean, what what could be more satisfying than that? Yeah, I, I had the you know pleasure of spending some time with my friend, uh, Dr. David Unwin, who has a large practice in, in the UK. And one of the things he does is exactly this, you know, low carb diets to deal with diabetes, pre-diabetes. And, and he published a recent paper that got quite a, quite a bit of a uh, yeah, uh, momentum. And it was what predicts 
diabetes reversal. And what they saw was obviously catching it early. You know, if you catch somebody in the first year of their diabetes diagnosis, you can turn it around because obviously you'd extrapolate that to the pre-diabetics as well. So it is, I mean, you can, you can literally change the course of someone's life um, uh, or, you know, you can, you can certainly improve where they're at uh, from that. And so uh, how, I guess, you know, the nice thing, you know, when you, when you hang a shingle out there and say, Hey, I'm here to treat you with a lifestyle, the people that come to you, come to you voluntarily because they want to make a change rather when the ER, they should, they end up in the ER because, Hey, something bad happened. They didn't really, no one, no one wants to go to the ER and everybody hates going to the ER. No one, even some of the physicians, <laughs> three, I know I'm just kidding, but I mean, it's like, you know, no, like when I had an orthopedic practice, no one really wanted to see me, you know, I mean, every once in a while they were suffering so bad. I, hey doc, do something. They, they don't want to be in that situation, but how, you know, how different is it having a motivated patient? I mean, that's gotta be the, the, the game changer. Yeah, it, it's great. I mean, I mean, you know that these patients are self-selected. You know, they're motivated. They come to me because they want to make these changes. Um, and the vast majority are capable of that. Every once in a while, you'll have a patient that just has difficulty in terms of meeting the carb targets or the protein targets or the fasting or whatever. But you, you know, the vast majority are very motivated, and I think that's another pleasurable part this type of practice. You're working with patients that have goals and will work with you to meet the goals. You know, sometimes those aren't always, uh, you, you, you know, you don't get directly to your goal as, as you know, it, you know, biological systems, physiological symptoms, you have improvement for a while, you might stall for a while, you know, you change your technique or your approach, you know, keto cycling, whatever. Um, but, but they're motivated people and they will work through these issues with you to help you get to that goal. You mentioned, uh, you know, and I, because I, I think it's such an important, you talked about strength training or, you know, resistance training. How, well, I guess let me ask you because, you know, you're, I don't know who you have as support staff because sometimes it takes a lot of hand holding and a lot of, you know, contact yeah. hours to, to really affect these changes. Do you do it all by yourself or do you have like some other sort of people helping you out? Yeah, no, I have a nutritionist and I have a personal trainer that I work with. And they're, you know, very, very valuable in helping people meet their goals. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of these people, middle-aged, you know, metabolic syndrome type patients, um, you know, they, they often don't have that experience in strength training. So, you know, you need to start slow. You know, um, I, I guess I'll be a little sexist here and say, you know, the women seem to get it. They kind of self-select for help better. You know, us men would rather bury our heads in the sand until we really have a problem. But the women, the women get it, I, I would say. And then, you know, a lot of them come to me in middle age and they have never strength trained before. And when you can get them on that path, then they, they get excited. I had one lady that never strength trained. She had been with me for about three months and she came into my office for a follow-up appointment and said she was brushing her hair in the mirror one day and noticed for the first time in her life that she had a bicep. And she was so excited about that and quite honestly, so motivated um, that, that, you know, she continued to do well. So, it, you know, get people into strength training for the first time, having them understand um, the, the, the strength training. And I tell them this, you know, I, I'll, you got to do a little bit of cardiovascular, you know, maybe, it, you know, follow the basic guidelines related to your cardiovascular training. But I, I want you spending three quarters of your time strength training um, because that's what's important. The, the thing they hear from me that I told them is different than a, a normal doctor. And this is, yeah, I, I'm sure consistent with your practice as well is, don't worry about your fat so much. Don't worry about your cholesterol so much. You know, go ahead and eat fat as you reduce your carbs and increase your protein. And, you know, I don't care you about you being on the elliptical that much. I want you in the weight room or bands or whatever approach you want to take. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty solid advice. Um, do you, one of the things that is a real challenge, even for people that are motivated to do it, is they, they deal with you know, basically food addiction. I mean, you know, I mean, with sugar addiction, processed food addiction, whatever, it's tough. I mean, we have a food system that's absolutely set up to create that and, and to, to uh, you know, sort of uh, keep people in that, in that thing. We've got studies after studies that now show that, you know, eating ultra-processed food makes you want to eat more of it. 
Uh, how do you deal with those folks? I mean, is there, is there, I mean, because, you know, even despite the best efforts, they often fail. Do you have a, a, a thought on, on how to manage that? Yeah, I mean, there are two approaches. One, one experientially, I think this is where the continuous glucose monitors come in. Because the way I work with people is I usually bring them in for a couple of weeks and I slap a CGM on them and I tell them not to change their diet. You know, and in their words, once they see those spikes, they can't unsee it. Quite honestly, that two week period in and of itself can be life changing for people because because they, they they see they thought they were healthy. You know, now they're seeing sugar spike to 170, 180. Sometimes they blow right through the pre-diabetic phase and they're spiking over 220 and they're diabetic. So that's kind of, you know, the first approach. And then I don't know how you practice, but but I I found um, that supporting people and having them go to fairly low carbs. I know you often go to no carbs, but, it, you know, this process of maybe trying to decrease carbs gradually, you know, 125 a day, 100 a day, 75 a day. I, I don't think that works because people don't get positive feedback from it. So I tell people, I think we should rip the Band-Aid off. We should get you to 50 grams of carbs or less today. And again, I know you have a practice where people were a lot lower than that. Um, but but that's usually where I start people. And quite honestly, they usually adapt pretty well when they see the CGM numbers and the changes in the CGM numbers and they understand what's at stake related to their insulin resistance. Yeah, there's, uh, it's interesting. There are a number of physicians that do not think a CGM is a good idea for a non-diabetic. You know, they just think there's no, there's no utility for it. It's going to lead to neurotic behavior because people are going to be scared to eat bananas and oatmeal and stuff like that, which they think is, you know, the, the greatest thing since sliced bread, I suppose. But do you, I mean, how valuable do you find this, this tool for obese patients? You know, you, you talk about metabolic syndrome, perhaps we should define what, maybe you could define what metabolic syndrome is for those that aren't, you know, up to date on that. And how, how valuable is that in those situations? Yeah, the CGMs are very valuable. Metabolic syndrome is, of course, being overweight, hypertension, problems with lipids, high blood sugar, and increased abdominal girth. The, the CGMs are life-changing. You know, I believe in this so much, I wrote the book about it, The, the CGM Revolution for Non-Diabetics. Um, and uh, I, I think CGMs are life-changing. Um, you know, the issue has been sometimes with insurance coverage, you know, insurance won't cover CGMs. Not Sometimes, even if you're diabetic, it won't cover a CGM. You got to be diabetic and on insulin for it to cover a CGM. But I think the great value of CGMs is, um, it is early on when people can significantly impact their long-term health and they're able to see those numbers. And I use it first diagnostically for a couple of weeks so people can see their numbers. And then we use it therapeutically to guide their low carb diets. Um, it, you know, the, the cost of CGM straight out of pocket is like 75 bucks if you have no coverage. I find that for the vast majority of my patients, uh, a CGM is at least partially covered. Most of my patients pay about 35 bucks for a two week CGM out of pocket. What an investment, it, you know, an investment that, that, that really for just a very limited amount of money and maybe even if you use them long term to guide your diet, still a relatively limited amount of money can, can, can change the direction of your life. So I think they're exceptionally valuable. Yeah, the interesting thing is that, you know, I talked with a CGM company several years ago. I was talking with the CEO of the company, and, you know, he's telling me that, you know, these things are, they make them in China for like 10 bucks. I mean, and then, you know, of course, they jack everything up because it's the U.S. And, and so they're, they're actually, the technology is not that expensive to produce. And if, you know, I guess if, if we were truly being altruistic, you could probably provide these very inexpensively to most people. But of course, you know, there's, you know, people want to make a profit, which is understandable. Um, do you find that, uh, you know, when people, uh, so one of the, one of the things I, you know, when I, when I first saw CGMs, I, my, my criticism was that, well, does it actually drive behavior? Because, you know, like people, like people that are addicted will say, well, I'm just not gonna look at my CGM anymore, or I'm gonna, or, you know, or we see people, and this is what I think you'll see. And I, I know we'll see this. We'll see uh, junk food companies manufacturing still junk food that doesn't impact the CGM. And so they're still like, I can eat this keto 
garbage right. and my CGM yeah. spike. And so how do you, how do we sort of, you know, I mean, I still education, I suppose, but I mean, you see how, you see how people try to get around everything to feed their addiction one way or the other. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I still believe quite honestly, they're exceptionally valuable when just opening people's eyes uh, and then guiding diet. And that, you know, is just consistent with my experience. Um, it, it, you know, the last chapter of the book is CGMs change people's lives. And I absolutely believe that based on people's initial reaction to their numbers, you know, and then you combine that with calculating their insulin resistance. You know, there, there's a, a little bit of an increased awareness out there of what insulin resistance is in the general population and the importance of it. And then when you drill down and do fasting insulin levels and calculate, you know, HOMA IRs, which for the listeners is the exact calculation of how much insulin resistance you have, then the combination of those two things can be enlightening. And then you follow them both along. You continue to follow the CGM numbers and you reevaluate the level of insulin resistance. And when people you know, see that with the results they're getting in terms of their weight loss and, you know, being able to deprescribe hypertension medications. And then they see, you know, quite honestly, either no change in their lipid profiles, their cholesterol profiles, or often significant improvement in their cholesterol profiles, including and specifically triglycerides. Um, that, that then people understand. I mean, they, they be, I, I don't do a lot of the conspiracy theory thing with the food pyramid and the food processing industry, but, but they begin to see that we have been misled for the last 50 years. Yeah. One thing I, I guess, you know, you'd mentioned when we talked about metabolic syndrome, you mentioned the lipid, you know, the lipid abnormalities there, but it, interestingly, the, the, at least the classic definition of metabolic syndrome included triglycerides and HDL, but didn't, didn't talk about LDL, which is kind of an interesting concept. And we've, we've seen, uh, you know, such an incredible myopic focus on lowering LDL cholesterol. I remember a few years ago, I remember it was, I think it was the fifth vital sign or something like no pain. It was a, it was a, it was like, it was, there was a know your numbers campaign. I mean, it was pain's a fifth vital sign. And then it was know your cholesterol number. And that was like, put up there with like, as relevant as your pulse rate, you know, this is so incredibly important. Yeah. And I think, uh, and maybe you can speak to that. You, you, I don't I'm sure you've seen hundreds and hundreds of MIs walk through your door and probably a significant percent of them are probably diabetic, pre-diabetic metabolic syndrome. And, and only, a, you know, a random percentage of them had super high cholesterol. Is that fair to say? Or do you mean it? That's absolutely fair to say for, for my patients, you know, everybody's focused on cholesterol. We've been told, told to focus on cholesterol. You know, there's obviously a lot of economic reasons for that because there's money to be made on on statins. Um, and then, you know, it's like you mentioned the fifth vital sign, pain. Well, we went down that road and that didn't really do much for us in terms of the opioid epidemic. Um, so we're, you, you know, kind of recurrently misled here and you know i have this patient population where and i don't i'm interested in your comments it, you know cholesterol may change a little bit usually you know go up a little bit go down a little bit hdl usually improves because you know blood sugar is the substrate for hdl um and then what i'm impressed with is what happens with triglycerides triglycerides just plummet on a low carb diet. I've had patients cut their triglycerides in half because of course, triglycerides are produced from the conversion of blood sugar to, to uh, fat in the liver. So people are just amazed that, uh, that their, their lipid profiles either generally improve. Um, and, and I do a lot of education, re-education with patients um, you know, having, having them understand that for you, your insulin resistance is, you know, 10, 20, 30 times more important than your cholesterol level. Um, because that elevated blood sugar is what's causing your vascular inflammation and what's going to lead to problems down the road. Um, and so when we can get them refocused really more on insulin resistance, um, and, and less focused on cholesterol than, you know, they're, they're heading down the right road. Yeah. I mean, it's just a huge study in New England journal of medicine just came out of 34 countries, 101.5 million people looking at predictors for all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease. And once again, diabetes just was just way up there. Whereas particularly with all cause mortality, 
cholesterol had no impact. I mean, you know, yeah. the only thing was low cholesterol. And, you know, obviously they'll say reverse causality, but low cholesterol increased all-cause mortality, high cholesterol, no increase in all-cause mortality. It did have an effect on cardiovascular disease. But again, it's just like, um, well, then I'm going to more likely die of cancer then. You know, it's kind of we'll, we'll pick your poison type of thing. But as far as living long, cholesterol, at least based on many, many now observational studies, doesn't seem to have have a, a net negative effect, or at least high cholesterol doesn't. So it's interesting to see. Um, so what about, uh, so you've got a trainer. How, um, how, how do you incorporate, is that, do they see these guys first off off the bat? I mean, it's like here, you know, I'm going to intake, here's a nutritionist, here's a trainer. And where did you find a nutritionist that actually supported low carb? Because they've often been sort of bought into the <laughs> the, the food, food, food pyramid-ish uh, dietary scheme. Yeah, I was fortunate. I just came across a lady that, that really had seen that, the, you know, the exchange diet that she was teaching diabetics wasn't working. Um, and she self-educated herself uh, related to a lower carb approach. So she is great. The, my nutritionist and my trainer see people in the first couple of weeks. We onboard them in terms of the process. I want people to know what they're gonna, what they need to expect as part of this program. My programs usually run about six months. Um, and then a lot of people continue in a maintenance phase, but I feel that that's about what it takes to make these lifestyle changes permanent. Um, and uh, the nutritionist is seeing them once a week and the personal trainer is it he actually has a local gym where some of the patients work out but he's great online with all court all kinds of support tools and videos and as i mentioned for those people that they haven't done a lot of strength training before that's important but you alluded to this it takes a team you know i can't do all this myself i can provide the medical expertise but when you got a team of people behind you um, and there are these multiple touch points every week that people feel supported. Yeah, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to respond to a question from, from somebody in the audience who was saying, you know, $400 for a CGM at Walmart. Where, where do you find, how do, how do you get patients to get that where it's more affordable? You said 35 bucks for, for, uh, uh, you know, a, a two week supply. How do you do that? Is there certain, certain companies you use? Well, I, I'll be honest with you. We we take their insurance information and and provide that to the pharmacy and maybe people's experience in other parts of the country. Obviously, if they aren't diabetic, they they won't have a prior authorization approved. But but it, it turns out that for most private insurance, I'm excluding Medicare and Medicaid here. But for unless you have Medicare with a with a Medicare Advantage program, sometimes that provides coverage. But but but. You know, the arrangement between the insurance companies is is somebody's, you know, an enrollee of theirs and a CGM is prescribed. You, you know, they still got a copay, but it cuts the cost in half. So, I, and, you, you know, I'm routinely, it's rare that I have a patient that has to pay the full out of pocket $75 cost for a CGM. The, the routine really is about 35 bucks a month. And then, of course, you know, as I'm sure you do, I monitor their data remotely. For some people, that's an increased incentive to know that the doc's looking at their numbers. You know, I, I, I don't bother them. I don't harass them. You know, they have a bad day. It, you know, we kind of watch things. But if they're going off track after four or five days, then we intervene along with the nutritionist. So, so again, I'm, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of these devices. I think that they have a big impact on people's lives. First, from just an educational and an understanding standpoint, and then from a dietary guidance standpoint. Um, let me ask you, uh, well, yes, yeah, as an ER physician, you know, I mean, this is something that, you know, I mean, we, we went through this big COVID pandemic and, uh, you know, a lot of people got sick, some, you know, a lot of people died. Um, many of them, probably most of them were metabolically compromised. That, I mean, that, that predicted that. And yet we had almost no... I mean, I mean, from what I can remember, there was no guidance about, you know, let's fix some of their metabolic parameters to protect them. I mean, as you probably know, you can change this stuff in a matter of days in many cases, particularly blood sugar management. 
what I mean, what did you see? I mean, again, in the ER, seeing heart attacks. I mean, I'm sure you saw patients with with COVID. Yeah. What did you see as far as the, the patient population, and could we have done a better job with regard to that aspect of it? Well, I think you know we can also always do a better job related to that education. But you're right; the the first wave was the older people in COVID, and I worked right through it. Um, and you know, a lot of people, other people did too. So you know, hats off to what I think the, the healthcare system did in terms of uh, rising and taking care of patients. But the first wave was the older patients. And then the metabolically ill patients, including, you know, some very young patients. I had patients in their 30s that had, you know, bad prediabetes, overweight, that I would be admitting to the ICU to get it, to get intubated. But, yeah, we, we, we talked a lot about, you know, vaccination and that kind of intervention. Um, but, but, you know, the healthcare system is not set up to address these issues that we're addressing, Sean. Like we just talked about the docs, you know, they get 20 minutes with a patient in their office. They're they're regimented to you get 20 minutes. I mean, th that's why the can gets kicked down the road in terms of prediabetes. Oh, oh, you're, you know, your blood sugar's a little bit high. We'll check it again in six months. Cause because they, and I'm not disparaging the primary care docs, but they don't have time to get into the whole thing about pre-diabetes and what's pre-diabetes and what does it mean and what are the dietary and the nutritional aspects of this, the exercise aspects of this that you have to address. You know, in our healthcare system, we just don't do that. We do disease management. And that's why I think it didn't get addressed during COVID as well. It's not an easy fix. And you got to have people that are motivated as well. And, and so this kind of support um, you, you know, is time intensive. It, it makes the biggest difference in people's lives long term. Um, but I, I think that, you know, what we did is we we reached for vaccines and we reached for medical management, uh, but we still not have addressed the underlying problems that will cause people to get very ill from either that pandemic or the next pandemic or really just their long-term underlying medical conditions. Let me ask you about uh, these, some of these new obesity drugs because they're using GLP-1 receptor agonists, you know, is that, you know, semaglutide and some of the other, uh, other ones out there. You know, there's, yeah. there's a couple different versions of that. Have you had any experience with that? Um, and what are your thoughts? I mean, good, bad, are there some problems so, or concerns? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? So uh, I'm going to, I don't know your perspective on this. So I'm going to go out on the limb with a uh, limb a little bit with, um, with what I'm saying here. Um, so first of all, I'm going to say the genie is out of the bottle on this. Okay. I mean, the, these are medicines that are going to be used. I personally believe they're going to become the most prescribed medicines in the history of the world. They're going to beat out statins. So the, the genie is out of the bottle. The problem is, is that they're being pursued by people. And they're being used by some clinicians um, as just just like here, take a shot and you're good. Um, and these medications have problems associated with it. I don't have to tell you this. It, it is the weight regain if you ever go off it. And as a clinician, you know, I, I don't think you, could, you should really bring a person into your office and say, hey, I'm going to start you on this medicine for weight loss um, and you're going to be on it for the rest of your life. Muscle mass issue is huge. You know, anybody that's on these medicines has to be strength training. You know, every week it seems like there's more side effects come out, whether it's gastroparesis, you know, two weeks ago or, you know, uh, increased suicidal thoughts a week ago. Um, but all that being said, I think these medications are going to be used to some degree. And I think that they should be used judiciously after lifestyle changes are made um, and um, with the consideration of, you, you know, begin with the end in mind. The end is that you're going to get off the medication um, and in very, you know, preferably low, very low doses. So you basically are dipping your toe in the water during the stall pe per period maybe um, with the intent of getting back out of the water. So, you know, I know a lot about a lot of metabolic health docs are saying, you know, we, we shouldn't be using these medicines, but I, I think people are going to use them no matter what. Um, and, and I think it's incumbent on us to be clinicians that if we are using them, we are using them very carefully at low doses 
with lifestyle changes having already been made um, and people understanding the implications of their use in terms of potential weight regain, muscle mass loss, and the side effects. Yeah, fair enough. And I, I think, you know, it's kind of funny as you watch through the history of all the different drugs that have been tried for weight loss, going back to dinitrophenol in the 30s and amphetamines in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, and then the fen, you know, the fen fens and all those things have all been pulled. They've all got pulled off the market. And some people yeah. are saying, well, this one's going to get pulled in a few years too. But it's interesting, you know, because I, I agree with you. I think they're going to be incredibly successful as far as how many people use them. Um, I think, you know, billions upon billions of dollars are going to be made by Nova Nordisk and other companies that are, that are putting this stuff out there. And, you know, the, the, the thought that I have, you know, cause I, I you know, I, I see when I look at the, what I think is, you know, obvious to me that metabolic health is driving cardiovascular disease. And I think cholesterol is a, maybe a dependent variable in there. That's my thought. Uh, but you know, when's that message going to change? I think the message changed when the, when the profit you know, a set of changes. And so this could be a drug that's used to like, you know, cause there, there is some evidence that, you know, these GLP-1 yeah. receptor agonists decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. And maybe we'll see an emphasis on that because, you know, instead of getting their millions or their billions from statins, they'll get their billions from, from, you know, these, these particular drugs. So we'll see how it goes, but if it gets, uh, uh, you know, some, you know, obviously I see all the concerns with, you know, thyroid cancer increases and even though it's right. pretty, still pretty rare, gastroparesis, uh, bowel obstruction, uh, you know, suicide thoughts, uh, you know, weight, weight regain, you know, some thought that, you know, you have this, uh, fat cell hyperplasia that goes on. And while the cells are insulin, you know, very, very insulin sensitive, um, once that turns around, when the drugs goes off, they'll just have this massive re weight regain, which, which could be a problem. And, uh, yeah, I agree a hundred percent that they should be, I think anybody losing weight should be strength training. I think, I think, you know, irrespective of how you lose it, you don't want to lose lean mass. That's, that's kind of metabolic gold in my, in my view. So, It'll be interesting to see how it plays out over the next few years, whether it's pulled or whether it becomes, you know, well, I know, I know, I know they've got this, you know, GLP-1 receptor agonist, but they've got another, you know, another drugs coming on there, GLP-1 receptor agonist, oh. GIP receptor agonist, and glucagon, you know, like a triple, a triple threat one, which is, is even probably going to yeah. be more effective, but probably will have more side effects most likely. So we'll see where this goes. Um, how, um, how, you know, as far as, you know, how frequently do you see patients being successful with your practice? You know, I mean, is it 90% success rate, 50% success rate? What, and, and can you, is there anything that predicts success in your mind? Do you say these, this guy's going to fly, she's going to struggle. I mean, is there anything you can, you can look at and say, you know, who's going to, who's going to do well and who's not? Yeah, I'll be, a, my, my success rate is high, but again, my patients are self-selected. You, you know, they, they come to me because this is what they want to do, and they know they're going to have to put some time and effort into it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, age is a factor um, and comorbidities are a factor. Um, you, you know, the, the, the younger, middle aged, um, even a little bit older person uh, that doesn't have all the comorbidities um, uh, do very well. I, I would say 90 percent or more of those people end up doing well. You, you know, it's the people that, that get at this late, well intentioned, but, you know, in their 70s and have, you know, cardiac issues, bone and joint issues that impact their working out routine. That, that's just a tougher patient population. A lot of times they can still achieve success um, and, you know, improve the, their their life. You know, the, the number of people that lower their blood sugar and have less joint pain is amazing to me. You know, you're, you're the orthopedic guy. And, you know, for all these years, we, we kind of focused on, well, you're overweight. There's more pressure on your knees. That's why you have pain as opposed to the direct inflammatory effect of, of having high blood sugar. Um, but, but to answer your question, it, it's, it's tougher with older people. There's, there's almost a hierarchy, you know, the young men are easiest, the young women next, uh, menopausal women get a little bit tougher. Um, uh, middle-aged men get a little bit tougher, but, but then the older population, it, it's, it's just harder. They have to be more diligent. It's not that they can achieve success. Um, but, but it's tougher when you've gone longer. 
uh, in that metabolic, uh, you know, unhealthy condition and you got comorbidities as well. Yeah, I'm glad you, you brought this up because I, I you know, I, I can't emphasize how much improving your metabolic health actually helps your 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 joint health, your, your orthopedic conditions. I, you know, for years, I, I, you know, I learned about mechanics and, you know, if you gain an extra 10 pounds, it's like an extra 60 pounds across your knee joint. And, you know, you look at the mechanics, but really what we're seeing is, you know, this systemic inflammatory response, you know, adipose derived cytokines, you know, high blood sugar. And it's important to realize that, you know, these things can, uh, dietary shifts can, I, I can remember early in my career, people would come in and tell me how bread or gluten would hurt their knees. And I thought they were crazy. I, I literally was like, I don't believe you. You know, I, I just, I was just sort of this typical sort of, I know it all doctor. And then once I started like looking at this stuff, I was like, wait a minute, these people are not only right, not only was I wrong, but they're very right. And I see that all the time. So it's important that people realize that how much diet impacts literally every aspect of their, phys uh, their health, including, I call a lot of like, a lot of the orthopedic conditions that I treated were basically, I call them the ortho orthopedic manifestations of, of metabolic disease. And I think that yeah. that's exactly what's going on here. So it's great to see that you're seeing that as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised by how much I think that plays a role, that inflammatory response plays a role. Because, you you know, you, you can correlate the CGM curves with the amount of joint pain people have. When they're spiking 160, 180. Um, they're having pain and you bring those numbers flat or irrespective of their weight loss and they're doing better. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, this was something when I, when I, this, what, one of the things that keyed me in this, I was putting people on low carb diets in an effort to have them lose weight so they could qualify for surgery because we were restricting on BMI for like a total joint. Yeah, and sure. I mean, I'd see people back two weeks later and they say, Hey, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. And I'm like, well, then we don't really need to do surgery anymore. <laughs> and, and so that was, and they didn't lose much weight. They lost, maybe, maybe they lost two pounds. You know, I was like, they lost and all their knee pain was gone. So that, that to me was eye opening. Not, 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 not every patient, but, but many of them did. So that was pretty eye opening. You, you know, in the parallel there is you, you think what's happening to your joints, what's happening to your blood vessels. Sure. The same thing is happening to your blood vessels. And, you know, that brings us back to, our, you know, the initial part of our discussion. That is the inflammation that is causing all those patients to come to the emergency department with, as you put it, an acute manifestation of a chronic disease. Yeah, absolutely. How do you how how are you received among your colleagues? I mean, you know, when you go to the ER, do they hey, what's going on in the meta? Do they think you're nuts, or do they are they they, they think it's cool, or what's what's the thought around the no, people? No, they think it's cool. Yeah, they're they're, they're intrigued by it. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, something has happened in our VA emergency department where. Um, this whole low carb approach is like to, I, I, we've got 15 people in our emergency departments that have gone low carb and had great success. I work with a nurse, not, not a patient of mine. I'm sad to say that I can't take credit for this, but you know, has lost 110 pounds on, on his low carb diet. So people in the emergency department are buying in. Um, I mean, pe people be, you know, we have casual conversations, you know, talking about, you know, the history of us, you, you know, turning away from a higher fat diet when we were told to follow the pyramid. And, you know, this is, you know, healthcare based group, they're educated and and, and they get it. Um, and then uh, in a larger uh, circle, um, it, it's been very satisfying to me to work with some of the prim primary care docs that initially are kind of looking at you like, what are you doing over there? You know, my patients coming to you and I've been managing their thyroid disease and their hypertension and, and, and now they're coming, they decided to come to you and, you know, you're telling them to eat a lot more fat and you're telling them not to worry about their cardiovascular training that much, but get in the weight room. And, and then, you know, after a little bit of time, when they're seeing the results, when they see the weight come off, when they see that they can reduce or eliminate their antihypertensive meds, when they see the, see their prediabetes is reversed, um, it, you know, it, it's been very satisfying. And, you know, I think I'm not going to take credit for this, but, but I think there's becoming an increased awareness um, and even the medical community, even though the primary care guys are so busy, they don't often have time to address it. They're, they're becoming increasingly aware that this is a path to health for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think, 
you know, the folks that don't sort of get with the program are going to be dinosaurs and no one's going to want to go to them because I mean, you know, like, like our company Rivera, I mean, we've got a nationwide, you know, 50 state option for people that want to deal with metabolic health. And honestly, I think, you know, given the options, I think most people, you know, there's some people who just want the pill, but I think most people, you know, you know, particularly people that have been on the pills for 20 years and now they're sick of it. They're like, look, I, this yeah. stuff doesn't really work that well. And I'm just tired of feeling like garbage all the time. Those people are going to convert. And I think we're going to have more and more people going that direction. I think, I think it's, une- I think it's inevitable quite honestly. And so I think that's the, the patients are ahead of the docs a lot of times on this, you okay. know, the, the patients are more educated um, than the docs on this, but you know, the, this is, you, you know, a little trite, but it is true medicine changes so slowly um and and it's going to be a generation but before you know in the, in the financial incentives are not on our side in terms of the statin approach or the management of hypertension but uh, so it's going to take a generation um but it's going to happen be, because you know the truth is the truth yeah that's exactly right you can't hide the results this is like you know it's it's just yeah. like you talk about evidence-based medicine you should talk about results-based medicine because you know you, you know the, you know, when you see all, all these sort of conflicts of interest that are that have been that have been out there, and it kind of, it kind of makes you skeptical in, in a way. And I, I know, I know there's some good researchers and people that are ethical, but the, unfortunately, that that's marred by those that maybe they're they're willing to take a little extra money to not look a certain way or something like that. And it's it's I think it's you know, obviously been harmful. Um, what? Let me ask you your own personal diet. What do you eat? What what, what kind of food are you eating? So basically, uh, I, I'm low carb. I'm not carnivore. Um, I, I do eat some um, cruciferous uh, vegetables. Um, but what I do is I kind of cycle. Yeah, I kind of keto cycle. It's like I'll be low carb, you, you know, 35 to 50 grams for a few months. I'll cycle down into ketosis for a while, um, maybe just two or three weeks. I'm not usually don't go permanently into ketosis. And then I cycle back up. I use my weight a little bit as a guide and really just how I feel. But but that's the approach I take. You know, obviously no sugar, uh, no grains. Um, and I think that that's a healthy approach. And for me, it works. Yeah. And I think that's that's obviously perfectly fine for you and many people. And I, you know, what I see, you know, cause obviously I, I'm an advocate of a carnivore diet, but I don't think everybody needs to do it quite honestly. I've never said that, but I, I do find it to be particularly those people with f- severe food addiction, uh, some of these autoimmune conditions, particularly some of these gut issues like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. It's been a godsend to those people. And, you know, to me, for those people that, you know, dismiss it and you should never use them. I'm like, this is a, this is a very powerful therapeutic tool and to, to, to not consider it for your patient to me is almost criminal in my mind, because I mean, I, I cannot tell you how many people I've seen who've had, you know, hunks of their gut ripped out, you know, small intestine, large intestine, probably unnecessarily if they would have just, you know, spent six months changing their diet. But, the, you know, a lot of the GI, amazingly, many GI physicians will tell these patients that diet has nothing to do with your gut disease. And I'm like, that is the most bizarre statement I've ever heard, but they actually, they, they kind of yeah. believe it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't get that. So, well, let me yeah. we discuss well, my favorite. I'm going to mention that my favorite meal I just, is, and because I had it early this week is ribs and a very dry glass of red wine. That, that's just like, that, that's Nirvana for it's me. Like some short ribs, that. some short ribs or something like that. Short ribs. Yeah. That's exactly what yeah. I had. Yeah. And, 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 and a yeah. good glass of red wine that's dry. So the call count is low. Um, and that's just my favorite way to spend an evening. There you go. That's good stuff. Yeah. The ribs are, ribs are wonderful. Um, let me, we, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, so let me, you said you're licensed in several States. Maybe you can share that, maybe share how a patient might want to hook up with you either locally in Dayton or, you know, through those States you're licensed sure. in. Yeah. Again, the majority of my practice is telemedicine. I appreciate you allowing me to share this. I'm licensed in Ohio. Indiana, Florida, and Arizona. Uh, the patients that I see in Indiana, Florida, and Arizona are all seen telemed. Um, and then, um, if I can mention, you know, the uh, I believe in the CGM approach so much that I wrote a book about it that was published a few months ago, and it's called "The Continuous Glucose Monitor Revolution." for non-diabetics, and, and really, it's just kind of chapter by chapter what we just talked about. You know, low carb intermittent fasting. We didn't talk a lot about that, but of course, that's part of this. Um, 
and uh, strength training. Um, and then I actually even talk a little bit about the prudent use of semaglutide in there as well. Well, awesome. Thank you uh, for that information, for being here, but also thanks you for, for just joining the fight because it's, it's, it is a fight and uh, we need good, strong warriors that, uh, you know, are, are willing to be, you know, good advocates. Just, I think you sound like a great advocate for this. So anyway, I wish you tremendous success. I hope you get gives it more patience than you can, you, know, you can handle and, uh, you, you, you know, help to little by little change the world. So thanks for being on here. It's been a pleasure after following you for years. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. All right. Thanks everybody. We'll see everybody back tomorrow. Y'all have a great day. Bye-bye now.